Hello and welcome to this Union Solidarity International Web Conference with Ricardo Bellafiore. Ricardo is a professor at the University of Bergamo and he has been one of the most astute analysts of the Eurozone crisis and uh, of everything that's gone wrong with the, both the global and the, the Euro economy. Ricardo, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Uh, welcome to you and good morning to everybody. Um, just to everyone who's joined us, um, we're very pleased to have you here. Probably the, the best way for you to contribute is to type a question into the side and um, I, will, I will try to drop that into the conversation at, at an appropriate point. So thank you again for joining us and I hope we have a very enlightening conversation. Um, Ricardo, I'd like to start with... Um, You've written quite a lot about the origins of the, of the financial collapse and we've heard different people give their opinion on it. Can you please run through for us what in your analysis is the problem? What went wrong with the global economy? You are now muted. Uh, yes, this of course is a big and difficult uh, question. Uh, my idea is that the crisis actually uh, was a financial and real crisis that is uh, wrong to be to separate the, the, the two things uh, saying that it is mostly a crisis or mostly a financial crisis the crisis is usually seen as um, beginning in september 2008 because of, of lehman brothers of course the crisis uh, in my view started uh, in the open uh, at least one year before, in June, July 2007, with the crisis of the supply. Uh, even though I would go so far as to say that the beginning of this crisis was in uh, uh, 2000, with the end of the dot-com uh, economy. And it was just uh, um, skipped over for a while, thanks to the supreme uh, phenomenon. Uh, so to understand then the crisis uh, of this capital, we have to understand which capital it went in crisis. And in my view, we have to go back. This capital actually is, uh, is the money manager capitalism of, uh, of Minsky. In my view, uh, we have to go back to the 1882, when there was the monetarist uh, episode to break uh, uh, the Keynesian uh, era, but also to break uh, the labor movement, the, the trade unions, etc. Et but uh, I think that one lesson that we have to learn also from Minsky is that the monetary street uh, episode ended very soon, between 82 and 85. Since uh, after the, 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 the mid 80s, we had the beginning uh, of uh, a new form of capitalism. Actually, it is the Greenspan era. Before it was Reagan, the second Reagan. The second Reagan answered the stagnationist tendencies with a kind of weaponized Keynesianism. The term is by, is by Paul Krugman. But paradoxically, even Alan Greenspan uh, was in his own way a Keynesian, what uh, I have called a privatized uh, Keynesianism. That is, he presided over the asset bubbles, they were first in this, the, the stock exchange, then later on in the housing. Uh, these asset bubbles were able to overcome the problems on the side of demand that came from the traumatized uh, workers. Uh, the asset bubbles were able to create a situation in which uh, the savers, and here I mean the households, uh, and here I mean uh, even more the workers' households which were uh, put into the stock exchange through the money managers, through uh, pension funds, etc., the, the savers were uh, trapped into, into this. Of course, there was somebody winning, most of them not, but they were trapped uh, and included in this form of financial Keynesianism, and were able or forced to go into debt. So if we want to understand this capital, we have to say that there were traumatized workers. For uh, a long while, there were uh, excited savers, so to speak, uh, 
uh, they were in a kind of manic phase which turned into indebted consumers. This was the American uh, form, the Anglo-Saxon form of capitalism. This capitalism uh, collapsed more and more because of financial crisis, uh, but at the same time we have to understand that this financial uh, form of capitalism was based, yes, on toxic assets, but this uh, perverse finance was essential for the capitalism to go on as a dynamic way. We had some areas, we would go back on them, I think, Europe and uh, Japan, since at least from the 90s, they were almost stagnating. But there were dynamic capitalism, the Anglo-Saxon one, the yeah, one, etc., which were able to overcome uh, the problems on the side of the mass. So this was, in my view, a dynamic, a dynamic capitalism. It was not so much a capitalism going uh, directly into crisis because uh, of uh, wage repression, because this is a problem that capitalism had always. In my view, capitalism always goes in crisis because there is a fall in autonomous demand, investment demand, etc. So the real problem to understand this crisis was why uh, a capitalism in which investment uh, was not really so strong, in which uh, there was uh, uh, a, 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 a tentative repression of, uh, of um, state expenditure, in which, of course, the world cannot, cannot export on the moon, in which the consumption from income was going down. How this capitalism was able to survive and even to go well? And the answer was that they invented this new form of indebted consumption and regulated it through monetary policy. That's why I say it was a very specific kind of, uh, of Keynesian, what I call uh, a financial and privatized Keynesian. It went down in, 80, in, in, in 2007. Uh, the crisis began actually a couple of years before because of the rate of interest going up, the housing bubble going down in the United States. And it was immediately diffused to, to Europe financially, but only one year later, the crisis in the US and then China became a worldwide real crisis. This is the beginning of the story. Too. Thank you. That, that is very enlightening. And um, how, how did we move from a global crisis to a European crisis? What is the link between the global crisis and what's happening in the Eurozone today? You know, in 2007, early to eight, uh, uh, there were people also from the left uh, who were talking of the linking. With a friend of mine, Joseph Alevi, we insisted from the beginning that the crisis would have reached uh, uh, Europe and even Italy, not only uh, through the financial chain. Uh, the first bank, banks who went into crisis were French, and German banks, together with with with, uh, with the um, Scottish and British banks, uh, the crisis would, would came to Europe not only because there were some countries in uh, in Europe which had a uh, housing uh, bubble, Japan and Ireland. At the time, Japan and Ireland, when they had the the housing bubble, they were good from the point of view of public finance. Huh? They had a a a, 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 a low public debt uh, GDP uh, ratio. But we thought that the crisis would have come to, to Europe because of a kind of uh, transmission chain of this kind. There is the crisis in, in the US. The US asked for less uh, Chinese products. So the Chinese economy goes down. It tended to go even below uh, the 8%. So the demand for countries like uh, uh, Germany and Italy uh, goes down. You have to understand that between 2007 and early 2008, the European economy, especially the exporting countries, seem to go well. And among the exporting countries, there are Germany and uh, the so-called uh, satellites of, of Germany, uh, which are the, the Netherlands, which are Belgium, 
which are uh, uh, Austria, which are Switzerland, which are uh, Finland, even Scandinavia, even uh, Sweden, who is uh, outside the euro. These are the net exporters. But you have to also include some part of Italy, because uh, uh, some part of Italy is, uh, is living on exports. Italy is the second manufacturing exporters in Europe. We are a kind of uh, sub-furniture of the high-quality German uh, manufacturing. So what happened was that the Chinese demand went down, the, uh, the, the, the demand from high-quality machines of Germany, uh, I'm doing a caricature, of course, to, uh, to Germany uh, went down, so the demand from Germany to Italy went down. And what happened was that since the mid of the 2008, uh, Europe went in uh, in uh, in crisis. In this period, uh, there was a kind of Keynesian phase in Europe too, not only in the US. The Keynesian phase was uh, to say finally, uh, but there was some kind of uh, low key uh, stimulus in uh, in Europe. Whatever were the wordings, some countries like France or even Germany and very intelligent, uh, active, uh, uh, active uh, uh, push in the economy. Italy just worked on the so-called automatic uh, stabilizer. For, so for 2008, mid-2009, uh, Europe was pushing uh, the, the uh, expenditures in deficit. Then what happened were two things. All over the world there was the idea that the crisis was over, uh, the uh, public debt was going up. People uh, forgot, especially governments, wanted that they forgot that the sovereign crisis was actually a private debt crisis uh, hidden in the in the public debt because the public debt had, had, had to save finance, had to save the economies. There were the automatic stabilizers and uh, and etc. And then there was Greece. Yeah? Greece and the peace, the awful uh, way not to say Greece, but to put Greece even more into the crisis. So the austerity policies were uh, pushing Europe in a further crisis. What I want to insist, however, is that the crisis in Europe went from outside. It was a kind of, of a bouncing uh, crisis for Europe. And this is, we will see, is, is true also for, for, uh, for Italy. Just the European structure, European policies, made things very, very, very much, uh, uh, much worse. I'm not a fan of the single currency. Since the early 90s, I was among those who actually saw the contradictions which were coming uh, from the single currency. I think that uh, a, a common currency would have been best. I mean, a currency. Uh, which was common to the central banks uh, of the European area, and in this European area uh, there was the possibility of changing the fixed exchange if needed be, a kind of uh, up-to-date Keynes 44 plan of the last century applied to, to Europe. This was not possible. When Europe went into the single currency, the, the strange thing is that it went well for a while. And it went, went well for a while for two reasons. There was the new economy and there was the subprime uh, uh, bubble in the US, so there was demand for European uh, products after 2003. And the second thing was that the markets started to think that every debtor in Europe was good as the German debtors. It was a kind of subprime effect in the European area. So for a while, even happened, as it should be in an area uh, very, with di very different countries, uh, with structural diversity, like, like, uh, like your area, it even happened that countries like uh, uh, Spain, Ireland, even Greece, uh, somehow even in Portugal, grew more than Germany and France, which by the way, grew more than Italy. But this thing, exploded with the crisis. So after the explosion of the crisis, we had the, the, the problem of the spread of the interest rate going up 
for the peace and of the austerity policies. But the fault is not of the euro. Euro is making things very much worse. Uh, but I'm not a believer that going out of the euro will be a, uh, a solution now. Um, thank you. And that brings us quite well to the next point. You don't think that it's a solution to leave the euro. Um, however, the eurozone is in a perilous position. Unemployment is really high. Is there a way to save the project? Is there a way to? To save the eurozone project. Can it be saved? Uh, you know, the, 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 of course, each question is more complicated <laughs> than the prior one. Uh, we are in a kind of uh, blind alley because staying in the euro as it is and in this structure uh, will mean an explosion of the area sooner or later. I am one of those that thinks that heterodox economies, even European economies, thought that this explosion will be sooner. I am one that th thinks that the explosion will be later. I very much believe in what Mario Draghi uh, said last year. Uh, we will do whatever it takes to uh, have the euro living. There has been a lot of capital invested in this and the other even, like in a kind of uh, a movie by Scorsese, you know, of the Mafia. And believe me, he said, it will be enough. Now, I think uh, there will be repeated efforts to save the euro, but if the euro is as it is now, and as it was at the beginning of the crisis, uh, the saving of the euro will mean for a long while a stagnation of the area, a permanent stagnation of the area, leading to an explosion of the euro. This is how, this is one third of what I want to say. The other third of what I want to say is that discourses also made by some heterodox economists uh, uh, that going out of the euro is a solution, they are wrong. Greece is not Argentina. Uh, Argentina uh, had a crisis because her currency was linked in a foreign currency. The euro currency is also the currency of Greece. So it is a dramatic error of the European Central Bank and European authorities to do what they did. And uh, this thing may be, may be repeated all over. I think that authors like Jan Toproski are right in saying that even if we had a, a small Eurozone with the Germany and the satellite, we could have had the, the Greece problem just it would have started in, uh, in, the, in uh, Belgium. Belgium has an almost 100% thing. If you have a central bank which does not act as a lender to uh, government, I think that also the economists that say, oh, look, in the past, uh, countries which went out the, of, a, of, of, a, uh, of a pegging after a while, yes, they devalued, but then they went uh, back in time. I do not exclude that after many suffering, they, 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 these countries will go better. But you can't compare the explosion of the Euro with the 92-93 episode in Italy, when Italy went out uh, from, uh, from the European uh, monetary system. And by the way, that period was a period of a huge beating, of the, a more beating for the, for the trade unions in Europe. But people have to understand that going out from a single currency in, uh, in Europe, in the middle of the global currency, uh, it's, uh, it's not a, 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 good, uh, a good perspective. Now I go to the third part of the answer to your question, which has to go back to the first part, and it is this. Uh, there is a kind of optical error in commentators. They always look at the euro as it is, at European policies, politics as they are, a European Central Bank, what it is doing down now, and they rightly show the contradictions. Uh, and they even think that the Draghi's uh, uh, 
very much uh, publicized uh, decision last uh, last year, uh, the one which saved the euro. I think that those uh, those measures were intrinsically contradictory. As soon as he will really start. Uh, as soon as you really need to help, say, Italy or Greece, the conditionality which is in this program will be very much uh, destroying this kind of measure. But I want to say is, look at what happened since the 2008. European policies are changing more and more. European Central Bank, for example, has done things that we never, never expected before. And in my view, Mario Draghi's project is to push European politicians and European e economies into a truly European project, going beyond uh, the, the, the nations, you see? So my point is that project is a project which is kind of creating truly a European capitalist class with the European politics in time, in a long time. Hmm? I don't, I'm not sure that he will succeed. What I think is the real uh, way to save Europe is for the working, for, for the trade unions, for the left to locate themselves at the level of the contradictions which Draghi is putting in front of us, which is European. We cannot save ourselves on a national level. And too much, uh, too many, sorry, too many of the heterodox economies all over Europe and also in Italy, they are doing the game of what they call uh, the poker uh, players or the risico player. I don't know if risico has in, in uh, it, it's a game in which you play a kind of uh, fake war, you know, and they are starting to say, oh, the government should be harder, oh, look, uh, we, if we move in this way nationally, no, there is no national exit from this crisis, which is good for, for the working class. The working class should start really to think on a European uh, level, on a world level even, but on a European level, thinking of uh, a renewed, a new, which is also a class new deal. Huh? It is a big crisis, we have to show not marginal changes, not just a return to Keynesianism, but a real structural reform, which is not structural reform of, of drive, should be our structure. I see a question by Giacomo. Mm -hmm. If exit of the euro is not a solution, what would you bet? What you suggest is a possible position? Do you hear me, Walton? I can hear you. Yes. The question is, uh, my que if exiting the euro is not a solution, would you suggest as a possible political option? Now the question as a trick because it is the the, the political is that. We have a lot of crisis in Europe going on now, and we have a, 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 a lot of brilliant ideas. What now is going on is, is of course, a crisis due demand. So we need to have a higher effective demand. This is the 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 say the Keynesian element in the crisis. Of course, we have a banking crisis. And there are discussions of having a banking uh, a banking union. We have a crisis due to the fact a transfer mechanism in uh, in, uh, in Europe, and this is, is due to the fact that there is not a real uh, European budget. You no, know? and we can go on. We had a problem of a sovereign in a sense, even though the sovereign debt is a fake crisis because. Europe as a whole has the same GDP, uh, public debt of, over GDP ratio of the US, maybe even even lower. Even if we are much lower than Japan, even if I think we are lower than UK debt, if the UK uh, ex public expenditure 
is accounted correctly, including the help for the banking system, even in this way we have in this uh, setting a, a problem of European public debt. I think that we have many brilliant ideas. One of them is the idea of Yanis Varoufakis uh, and others to have Eurobonds. Uh, I think that uh, uh, they are right in saying that partially the Eurobonds should be used to finance uh, uh, a, an expenditure for uh, big European projects, which doesn't mean usual big infrastructures, but a big push in the uh, expenditure in Europe. I think that we should think uh, of uh, a coordinated expansion in Europe of public, uh, of public uh, expenditure. But I think that we sh cannot stop here. I think that we have to look also at the supply side, at the composition of our. This crisis is a crisis not just because there has been a collapse of effective demand, but because even when consumption was high, even when Europe exported uh, uh, very much in the world, uh, and even in this way, actually, Germany the satellites had profits, uh, because they were able to have net exports in the world and inside inside Europe. The problem is that what we produced was not really uh, good for people. Let, let, let me put in this uh, in this way. Of course, we need to have higher uh, wages, direct and indirect wages. We, 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 but we need to have uh, higher retribution to workers with different things. I think that this crisis is a crisis also not only of employment, but it is also a crisis affecting uh, uh, nature and affecting the gender dimension. This will be a very huge, uh, huge discourse, and I think you should invite some woman who, who, who talk of the gender dimension of crisis, which is not just the fact that women are more raped during the crisis that in the labor process, in the process of labor, sorry, the labor process, in the market of labor, in, um, in the quality of the, 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 the public expenditure, uh, in the amount of the non-paid work that they do, they are very much oppressed. Now, I think that to go out from this crisis, we need to propose a new deal a new deal. I, I'm referring to, um, to to Roosevelt, of course, to Roosevelt New Deal in the 30s, since 30, uh, to, 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 since 33 to 37. It was a very interesting experiment because Roosevelt was not a Canadian. He didn't love uh, deficit expenditure, but what he did was to have the state that directly, directly. Uh, expanded in projects, uh, so there was a targeted expenditure driven by the state, and the second thing is that he was an employer of first resort. This terminology I take from my friend Emiliano Braccaccio, I said with a lady something very similar before referring to a kind of labor plan, or piano del lavoro in, in Italian. The state is directly an employer. This is crucial. This is not something which, which has to be there later. This is the answer to the crisis. Then Giacomo says, is this a possible political option? Now, I don't think that we will ever, our left will ever go to the common. But I think that we can push uh, for a new deal which accepts the Canadian element of deficit spending, but which also is class and gender new deal because it goes into the composition of output and we have to propose this exactly now as a European left dimension because in this way we can do something that uh, Gramsci proposed in the Tesi di Leone, Lion Tesi in the 27 if I remember well. 
That is, it must be a political project which may be implemented. It is not just that they some one request to the other. Even if we don't want to go to the government, because we push the government, and on that kind of project, we rely the different subjectivities with the centrality of labor, but the centrality of labor is not the blindness to or relative to the other dimension. This is urgent. We can't just say, oh, let me start with the wages. Let me start with the with the Keynesian policies. This is a big capitalist crisis. We have to start from this kind of big dimension. If not now, when? Thank you. That that is helpful. Um, and we are from the trade union movement, so this is important for us, and we need to learn how to respond to it. There was a an attempt at a Europe-wide general strike last year. I think it was the 14th of November. Is that the sort of thing that that we should be doing? Is that what we should be trying to do to come together as unions across the continent in that way? Uh, yes and no. Yes, of course, there have been more of those kind of things. But you know, I one that thinks who thinks that more uh, national and European strikes are needed. But I don't think that national European even war strikes work if there is a preparation and if they go beyond in the individual working places. You know, I work in the university and it is very depressing. Even the people of the left don't go to national, uh, to national strike. But the problem is not just uh, that they don't go to strike. The problem is that they don't act as workers the other days uh, of, the, of the year. So what I'm saying is that the culture and the practice of the trade unions and the left must be immediately uh, European. I don't know any other uh, European leaders of trade unions or left parties who are more talking of globalization than Italian ones. Then when they go into their propositions on trade unions or policies, they are national. We must have a European platform. And our platform must from the beginning be nationally articulation of that. And not just in in the present way which is more uh, an idealistically uh, wording of European of European terms. We have to, to start to think in European terms. I give you an example. Hmm? Uh, there are very interesting proposals of having a kind of uh, wage solution to the balance of uh, to the trade balance problem in Europe. You know that in Europe there are some countries which have current account balances positive and others which have uh, current uh, balance accounts negative. So the idea is even uh, the, the left uh, Oscar Lafontaine leader in Germany says something like this. Let have the wage grow more that the wages grow more where uh, there are current uh, positive current accounts. This misses two problems. This translates the difference in productivity uh, in the different areas, in different in new labor costs, and a solution to them. But the solution is that now, if the policy works, and they're not sure, you have just uh, uh, that the current accounts disappear, and you have a widening of inequality among workers. The second is that I am not one of those that think that the uh, difference between productivity and the wage must be absorbed by the current wage growing up in money terms. I think that, of course, money wages and real wages must go up, but this is part of the story. I think that the problem is what goes into the wage, and most of it must be provided publicly, uh, in state or, 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 or other way. 
it must be provided in different in different ways. So the difference must be uh, used for a kind of uh, communal consumption. The term is not from Marx, it's from Minsky in the 70s. And we have to go into a socialization of investment. The term again is not from Marx, I think you would agree, but it is from <laughs> Minsky gave a very much higher uh, interpretation, as something in which the commanding hate are publicly uh, uh, governed, and so we intervene in what is produced. If we don't have this, just an higher wages is, is not a solution. It may it may help to go out from the worst period of the crisis. I'm not denying this, but this is not our uh, side of the story. Um, thank you, and. Um You've probably seen Giacomo's uh, comments on how he agrees with you and you should talk about these topics to Italian and European leftist movements as well. And uh, not <laughs> Maybe I don't talk too much, but I say those things. <laughs> okay. So it's just that I am a minor economist, <laughs> or I don't know, or maybe people just don't listen to this kind of thing, I don't know. Okay. You, you've spoken quite eloquently about the need for a, a European wide solution and particularly from from unions and leftist movements in uh, across Europe I'd like to kind of go against the grain of that discussion and find out what's happening in Italy um, so that we know what you're facing and uh, that's because of your, your banking crisis your imminent elections and also the the proposed changes to to uh, labor, labor market and, and pensions what's happening what what's the situation in Italy at the moment uh, yes, here again I, I, I'll try to give you some complexity. Okay. Some German comrades of the journal Das Argument asked me a paper on, uh, on the, also on the Italian uh, situation. And I titled it uh, uh, in a strange way, uh, The um, Paradigmatic Exception. You can look at Italy as an exception since many decades, maybe even after World War II, but for sure Italy may be seen as an exception uh, in the last decades, and in this case as a bad exception, because we are going worse than other countries. Huh? And you know that Italy now is considered the, the, the sick uh, the sick country uh, in uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, the most it, after Greece, there are others of course, but uh, Spain and Italy. Spain and Italy are bigger. And Italy, if Italy uh, goes out from the Euro, the Euro does not exist anymore. If Italy collapses, Italy does not exist anymore. We have many dimensions of the Italian crisis now. But I think that they are more, more exemplary of what is going on elsewhere than just uh, a pure exception. Uh, now in these days we have a banking uh, crisis, the Monte dei Paschi episode, but I think it is not really uh, too much connected with the global crisis, the subcurrent crisis of the last few years of crisis. It is more connected with the way in Italy the banking system has been uh, uh, affected by huge concentrations uh, and this was a part of a policy of uh, liberalization and privatization. Uh, in this uh, there, was a, uh, there were huge errors made by the Monte uh, It is also true, however, that there is a political dimension for it because this liberalization and this privatization were done especially by the Berlusconi government, just not cancelling the influence of politics from the national level, just uh, creating a, a, a political uh, influence at the local level. And that they, it's true that, that, what, that what some uh, uh, free marketers say, that, that, that this is... But I think that the real crisis uh, uh, of, uh, of Italy in the last few years may be summarized in, uh, in some uh, 
in some uh, uh, situations. The first is that Italy has a negative growth of uh, the productivity of labor, at least since one look at we regard the income for uh, for resident, it is going uh, uh, very very slowly since at least 20 years. 20. Years, yeah? So we have uh, a problem of an economy which does not grow very much. The second dimension is that Italy has seen almost the disappearance of the big firms. Eh? Uh, the, the, the only big firm remaining is Fiat, and it is not going actually very well since years. Uh, others big, uh, big um, firms were public in nature, and they, they were privatized, and they were the, the place where rent-seeking capitalists went just to to have more easy, easy money. Most of the Italian uh, productive structure is uh, by very, very, very small, uh, very small uh, firms. Uh, this is also due to the fact that the, 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 the Statuto dei Lavoratori defended only the first over 15 uh, uh, employees. Rather than reducing the number, <laughs> that is, giving the guarantees to, to everybody, the solution that the new government is going, going uh, uh, on is to actually cancel this, this, this article and these this, this guarantees. But uh, also there are small and medium firms, the so-called district, uh, the Italian districts, which are mostly in crisis. Now, these two things, the reduction of productivity and the, this, the, and the fact that we have no big firms uh, and uh, many, many uh, small, medium firms means that we don't have research and development and this means also that we are very weak in, uh, 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 on the side of the uh, external trade account. Huh? And I can, uh, uh, I can go to the labor market. In the labor market, we have a situation of casualization of labor, which is really, really uh, amazing. I think that Italy has been the country which has most, most made uh, experiments in the privatization of firms and in the, in the precarization, the casualization of labor. And probably we are the, the most privatizing countries and the most causalizing labor country, if the world even exists uh, exist in English. This structure existed before the crisis. It does not explain the crisis of the last few years. You know? The crisis in Italy in the last few years, uh, let me put it in, in this way, European crisis is the bouncing of the crisis made in USA. The Italian crisis is the bouncing on Italy of the crisis of Europe. So what happened in Europe? In Europe ha happened that after Greece, European policies made the situation of Greece worse. Even if you had condoned the, the debt of, uh, of Greece, the situation would have been better. The, 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 the debt of Greece over Europe was very, very low. Of course, there would have been a problem of the financial interconnections, uh, but it could have been managed. No, what happened was that Greece went down further in debt, so there was uh, a contagion of crisis to Ireland, then to Portugal. Everybody knew that the contagion would have come to Spain and then Italy. In the summer of 2011, when Spain was hit, uh, also Italy was hit, and the markets uh, were against. Why they were were, uh, were against uh, and the thing about the spread, etc. The markets in, 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 this, uh, in this case are innocent. They were right. If you are uh, an agent who goes into the, the, the financial market at European politicians, they are doing nothing. What they are doing is uh, cancelling growth in Europe. 
and it is more so in Italy. Then it is true, Italy has been the most virtuous country in Europe regarding the deficit over the GDP. We had the slowest growth of the deficit over the GDP. Why did the GDP went up? Because the GDP went down, but actually controlled our our deficit. But we had a huge stock from the past. So the markets say, well, what the markets see? No growth. The rate of interest going up to seven percent. You have a huge debt from the past. This means that in two years you will be not anymore illiquid. You will be. You will not be solvent. The markets then anticipate the result. So there was this kind of soft coup d'état in uh, in late 2011 with uh, with uh, Monti who was imposed to Italy instead of Berlusconi. I'm not a fan of Berlusconi, but the way Berlusconi was put out of poverty was not really, really, really very, uh, very good. Let me add over a couple of things. We are net importers, but this is also due to the fact that we have no uh, autonomy for energy and for oil. If you put that this aside, our trade balance is positive, our uh, uh, net account is positive. Another thing, it is true that the situation of the Italian industry is not bad. But I said before, we are the second manufacturing exporter in Europe. This is not the picture of a weak industry all over the board. We have what somebody called for capitalism. This for capitalism is the capitalism of those kind of medium enterprises or medium firms who became pocket multinationals. They even have foreign uh, investments and they were able to conquer market. Huh? And in fact, they don't want to pay wages relative to their higher productivity. But what I'm, I'm saying is that there are sectors which are going well with high productivity. The error of the people saying, oh, Italy is going well in the industry, because they made the same error that they did with the industrial districts, to think that in Europe, sorry, that in Italy, uh, the Italian system could be uh, uh, all of this kind of pocket multinational. That they are enough to make a good system. No, if you go, if you look at uh, China or if you look at Germany, why they are good countries? Because they have a complete matrix of sectors and industries. And this is true for Europe as a whole. It is not true for Italy. So this will not save Italy. What I'm just wanted to say is that Italy is a contradictory country. Even if you look at our situation, if you look at the debt, the total debt, private and public debt, we are better than other European countries. So why Italy is, an, a, a, is a paradigmatic example? Because Italy is a country which can be saved only from a European perspective in terms of output, not just with Keynesian policies, certainly not with liber uh, liberalization policies or prioritizing policies. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I, I don't have any more questions, Emiliano, uh, Luca, if, if, if you have anything else that you'd like to ask, I think this is your, your last opportunity to do so. Um, Ricardo, is there anything else you'd like to add before we finish? Yes or no, but if I go for the yes, it would be 20 hours, so I, was, I would go for the no. <laughs> okay. Perhaps, um, perhaps we should leave that for a, for a second conversation uh, in, in future. Yeah. Um, thank you once again for joining us. That was very enlightening and very useful for us to, to hear your perspective. Thank you for joining us here, and uh, we, will, we will put this on YouTube and on iTunes so that people can, can watch and listen to it as well. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Bye, everybody. Hello.